Welcome to the Summer 2020 Composers Conference and to this online concert tribute to our dear friend Mario Davidovsky. You are about to hear some extraordinary performances of some of Mario's 12 synchronisms pieces, his best known works that combine live instruments with electronic sounds on tape. I'm Eric Chaslow and I studied with Mario at the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center between 1977 and and 1985. Those were life-changing years for me, and I am honored now to be able to share some of the history and some of the technical background of these wonderful pieces. Rather than lecturing, though, I'll briefly introduce a few topics and then let Mario himself tell you more. The excerpts that follow are from interviews that my wife Barbara and I conducted with Mario at his barn in Wilcott, Vermont, back in 1997. Commenting on an early example of Davidovsky's electronic music in the 1960s, Karlheinz Stockhausen declared, I feel that after hearing the piece, I am no longer the same person as before. But what is it about Davidovsky's electronic music that inspired a renowned and experienced composer to make such a statement? Stockhausen was actually expressing a reaction that many, many musicians have had with this music. As a college student in the 70s, studying flute and composition. When I first heard Synchronisms number no. 1 for flute and tape, my sense of what music could be changed. It used electronic sounds to create new kinds of phrases that were both sophisticated and sensitive. And I was surprised that someone had found a way to integrate instruments with tape sounds that was free of the crude electronic cliches that we had come to expect. To really understand this achievement, it's important to know the context. When Mario arrived at the studio in about 1960, everything had to be handmade. That is, there were no synthesizers and no shortcuts. This was the classic tape studio. The equipment didn't include anything built with the idea of making music with it. There were test oscillators to make pitches, some filters to alter timbre, a few handmade devices, and some tape recorders. In fact, even after the arrival of synthesizers from Moog and Buchla after 1965, Davidovsky's approach was still to craft each sound individually with little or no automation of the process. Mario was always looking for interesting metaphors and he described working in the early studio as being left in the desert for a few days with a knife and a jug of water. This was new territory, and he enjoyed exploring. You know, when we were in the studio, and the studios were, were non-profit, you know, there were just, few, you know, you were confronted with very basic problems in music, you know, I mean, you know, can you produce sounds that are genuine sound? Yes. Are the, those sounds can be very beautiful? Yes. They can be very expressive? Yes. You know, they could be very, you know, uh, uplifting, yes. They could be very depressing, most of the cases, yes, right? Uh, but we cannot write a tune, we cannot, you know, we have problems, uh, uh, you know, holding pitch, we cannot uh, write polyphony because we didn't have the technology. You know, how, can you do music? W you know, is it possible to write a music for that? So, you know, we were really tied up with our hands in bag because, you know, the instruments were so primitive. In that primitive environment, it was necessary to find exactly what one could control to shape musical phrases. As the synchronisms pieces themselves make clear, and as Mario explained, the envelope characteristics, that is, the attack, sustain, and decay of each sound, were key. Uh, one year after I was in the studio, I started to rea realize the differences, how different, for example, my approach was than Boulin's or, or Vladimir's approach, you know. I mean, I'm talking about people working in the old-fashioned tape studio. And to me, the most important thing that uh, desperately I need to control is the envelope, because the, the, the envelope gives me the, the way to articulate music, and I need to articulate music in order to say something. So to me, that was the crucial uh, piece of equipment, how I can make the sound speak, you know, a syllable or, or a letter or a word, because then I can make a phrase. So a phrase could now open up or find closure, not just through a series of pitches, 
but also through a succession of different attacks, from very hard and abrupt to one so gradual that notes gently appeared out of silence. A succession of widely varying articulations could shape a motive that could be developed over the course of an entire piece. Having worked his technique out through a series of three increasingly skillful electronic studies, in 1962, Mario turned his attention to the first synchronism. I asked him to say more about that choice. We were politically involved with the cause of electronic music. We are, we are going to fight this. In, you know, we thought that electronic music was Messiah, it's going to save everything, and we would be able to do anything, and everything under the sky will be, will be now accessible to us. And, and one of the reasons uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, good reasons uh, or good techniques to politicize electronic music and make it more palatable is to have somebody, uh, a, a performer, because given the conditions of the time, you only could play electronic music probably in the stage of a university, you know, where you could find equipment, more or less adequate equipment. And the stage is not a place to play electronic music. I mean, the stage, uh, as such a strong cultural connotation, you expect somebody to come out and do something. And here you have these horrible looking black boxes, you know, that didn't do anything, you know, ex except the playback sound. So in, in a way I thought that that would be a very attractive way to, 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 to bring, electro to mainstream electronic music into, into a situation that is familiar by having a performer. From the other side, that's the less important reason, the, the, the real important reason was really, oh, I learned something new, you know, I learned uh, how to do new sounds and different sounds. I want those sounds to slowly become part of me, be by part, by part of the tradition. I did a few pieces that use electronic music in combination with instrument because, in a way, I thought that the, the, the possibility was, it was a natural thing to do. I mean, uh, were, were you aware of other people who had done this kind of No, I was aware of deserts, various deserts, and uh, 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 Usachevsky Lunin, or uh, New York piece, and some other pieces, but I, uh, to be frank, I, I didn't think that the piece uh, succeeded, because in a way there was not aesthetically a real integration of, of, the, the, of, of, the, the, of the elements. There were juxtaposed elements. And, and worse is that, uh, worse even, is that in a way is that the orchestra was playing, let's say, or the ensemble was playing in a, uh, 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 as much in pitch as the New York Philharmonic can play in New York, but 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 the pitch system was was you know 12 tone at 440 the A, you know, and the, the tape uh, pitch was all over the place. So you, there was a real discrepancy on 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 the pitch. There was a real discrepancy on the space implied in the sounds, the space of the sound coming from the orchestra, the space implied in the sound coming from the loudspeakers, and also on the articulation because the orchestra had very, you know, very different articulations for sando pianos, and the sounds on the tape were more kind of the electronic sounds available at the time. So in, in a way, uh, 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 that for me was a great challenge. So, well, how can you bring that into, into a way that is natural? I didn't have any model, really, essentially. And the music available, I didn't like, really. I, I mean, it was very respectable, but I didn't feel that it really succeeded. When he decided to find his own way to combine instruments with tape, Mario chose the flute for the first piece for a few different reasons. Then, you know, then I, I said, well, I should take an instrument that is very easy to ensemble, and, you know, and the higher pitch of the flute is almost like a sine wave almost, and it's very agile, you know, can, and can control uh, the dynamic fairly well over a very extended uh, register, and uh, you know, and uh, it would be very responsive to a dialogue with tape, you know, and, uh, and immediately when I went to do that, I discovered really how difficult it was uh, to, uh, to, for example, uh, unify pitch. So in a way what I did, I used simply durations that were below a fifteenth of a second. So you wouldn't be able to tell what the notes in the tape were. So I was really fooling your ear using our limitation as a way of creating high pitch, low pitch, very high pitch, very low pitch, very middle pitch. So in a way what you hear the tape, you hear pitches that don't disagree with the tape, with, with the flute. So in, in a flute, the, 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 the flute was the pitchifier, and sometimes you would think that you would hear fourth and fifth and sixth, when they were not. 
in a way. So you created at that level a, 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 a illusion of, of, a, of, a, of consistency. So what was the experience of the premiere of this piece like when you finally got it done and you were working with Harvey Solberger? And well, of course, uh, uh, Harvey was, was uh, to me, flute man Harvey, because, you know, the group of contemporary music was there and we were all, you know, a bunch of young kids, you know, very busy, always being together and doing things and rehearsing. And, you know, and his fluting, his, his fl flutism, um, uh, very percussive, very, 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 uh, you know, and very elegant, uh, uh, you know, uh, very big amplitude of, of, of the dynamics, you know, like, like uh, uh, and of course, a very just uh, finishedly, you know, able technically, you know, opened up the flute uh, as an instrument. So that was very useful that the flute was the instrument and you have such a wonderful flutist who was teaching me, you know, what the flute was in his hands and, and the flute became a different instrument for me. So, uh, 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 yeah, we played the piece, it was a tremendous success, I remember. We played it twice because something went wrong. I, I think I missed, I was so nervous that I missed one of the cues. By the time Mario composed his Pulitzer Prize-winning Synchronisms No. 6 in 1970, his vocabulary was well established. In this virtuosic piece, which is my personal favorite, the musical ideas can only be realized, could only be expressed by this combination of instruments, the physical and the virtual. There's a momentum built up by cross-cutting between sections with contrasting musical time some fast, others slow to static, almost like filmmaking. And this creates an intense feeling of expectation that pulls the listener along for the ride. The other piece I want to talk about very specifically is synchronism number six. Yeah. Because by, at that point, um, you've already accumulated certain kinds of yeah. techniques and some very special things happen in that piece. Well, first of all, it's true. I think that, that, that in a way I got my uh, chops for, uh, for writing for instruments and, 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 and instruments established there. Because I think that after that piece, the sub subsequent pieces, very much uh, technically, I, I established my, my domain almost in that piece, I think. It, it succeeded in doing exactly what I was trying to do uh, for, uh, for in the previous pieces, essentially. The piano was almost the ideal instrument uh, to, to use to write for, for, for tape, because the, the piano is a percussive instrument. Percussive sounds are the most successful sounds that you can create with this technology. So the whole, you know, assemblage, uh, you know, that I was so interested in creating, you know, almost a chamber music, you know, a, 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 a consistency, was greatly facilitated by the instrument, in a way. And, uh, and again, you know, I, I, I got very involved, and the piano is actually an instrument for which I have no talent whatsoever. The, 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 I have a block against the piano. I cannot think about piano, write about the piano, you know, musically. I always use the piano in chamber music as a, as a, as a, as a percussive instrument. When I fantasize, you know, I say, well, I have to write a piano piece, I start to think about the piano, I, I cannot avoid thinking about all the qualities, acoustical qualities innate to the instrument, you know. I say, well, the instrument uh, is percussive, so you have an attack and, and it decays and it dies. It doesn't sustain, you know, it doesn't play melodies. So immediately I say, well, what can I do to reverse? How can I use the tape to embed the tape inside the piano and make the piano much bigger than it is or much smaller than it is? You know, in other words, how can I get one space inside the other one and totally, you no. Know, creatively deface the instrument and enrich it with what, what I could provide, or what the, the tape could provide. So as you know, for example, um, it, during the piece, I tried to modify the, the, the acoustic. I mean, it starts with a G that when it's properly played uh, and timed, and, and when the acoustics of the, of the hall is proper, makes sound like the G in the piano, as a, you know, you know, the piano attacks the G, and then there's a crescendo. So the, the idea is that the piano suddenly becomes like a huge pregnant instrument, you know, it's very big. Or sometimes I use attacks, electronic attack, to make the piano very brittle, almost like a tiny toy piano. So I use acoustics in a way, uh, procedures, to really manipulate the perception of the instrument 
to create a, a, an instrument that eventually, I mean, hopefully, what you try to do is the result is better than the combination. It's better than the parts, you know. The next two synchronisms were for ensemble. Number seven for the New York Philharmonic came in 1973, and number eight for a wind quintet in 74. By that time, Mario was already starting to turn his focus to instrumental music without the addition of electronics. But the effect that his studio experience had on all subsequent pieces was profound. With lots of commissions for ensemble pieces and having done what he had set out to do in electronic music, it was not until 1988 that Mario returned to the studio to compose. By 88, when Mario composed Synchronisms No. 9 for violin and tape, digital studios had mostly replaced analog studios. Rather than learning the new technology, he collaborated with a composer technician who created the sounds under his direction. This was a practice he followed all the way through the final synchronism number 12. In our interview, Mario often made mention of the importance of collaborating, especially with performers that he was writing for. I remember writing the violin piece for, for Schulte. You know, and Schulte was very, very enthusiastic about the piece. And then I hear, here is the music and here is the tape. He hated it in the beginning because, you know, he just couldn't, he was very uncomfortable playing this with this absolutely unyielding, inexorable machine that, you know, was always coming, you know, and he was kind of in a very sweet and, and you know, and diplomatic way complaining about that because he never did it before. And then once he got to know the, 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 the electronic part and became you know, part of his fingers. He could just play the piece any, any way he wanted. And he, you know, he liked, the, liked the experience. And then he, remember he said, well, you know, in a way, you know, if you want to rehearse at five o'clock in the morning, you just turn on the tape recorder. You don't have to call your pianist at five o'clock in the morning to come to your living room to rehearse. So, but, but in a way it has been for, for uh, performers and performers that have a sense of, of didactics and education uh, uh, a great experience, and in a way they were telling me how tape sounds could be used in a very, very creative way for pedagogy, you know, to, you know, to, to refine the sense of, of duration, of rhythm, and, you know, a pitch, and on and on, you know. And I learned through them, in a way, uh, that really, uh, you know, all these all this, uh, kind of positive, uh, uh, you know, sub-products of experience, actually. Thanks for joining me and Mario. Now, please listen carefully to these beautiful, elegant, and thought-provoking pieces performed by members of the Composers' Conference Ensemble, some of the most dedicated and extraordinary musicians anywhere.
Thank you. 